From New York City for our viewers worldwide, I'm Shanali Basak and Bloomberg Real Yield starts right now. Coming up, Fed officials drawing caution on easing too soon. And rates go on a ride higher with strong economic data. And credit markets are booming with record issuance. But we begin with the big issue, the right time to cut rates. It does seem to be more hesitancy than we thought there was at the Fed to start uh, rate cuts. They are sticking to their slower to lower interest rate uh, mantra. They don't dive into the rate cuts. We're not really sure when the Fed goes the first time. They've pretty clearly told us that they're not going to pull the trigger in March. Is it May? Is it June? Is it July? We think that starts in June. 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 The best way for the Fed to proceed is gradually. The Fed is beholden to the inflation data. The Fed has gone all in on data driven. There are risks on both. Uh, sides. The markets are underappreciating and underestimating the um, polar opposite risks. If inflation moves up, inflation is unable to come down. You wouldn't want to attach a zero probability to the fact that they may need to hike. The Fed perhaps has to, in, dare I say it, hike rather than cut. By the time May, June rolls around, we'll have a lot more data on everything. For those people thinking it would be a rocky path lower for lower interest rates here, they were certainly right. And if you take a look, we are lower than where we were about six months ago when there it was initial expectations for a ped, Fed pivot somewhere along the way. You take a look lower here. And in January, we were getting closer to that 4% level in that two-year yield. And look how far back we've shot up. You were comfortably roughly 50 basis points, give or take, higher. And this week, hitting more than 4.70% percent here, at least 4.1 percent at some points in time this week, on the heels of strong economic data, plus a lot of Fed officials cautioning not to have those rate cuts too soon. We will talk a little bit more about that, but I want to talk about those expectations. Let's flip up the board here and look at the WIRP screen on the Bloomberg terminal. This has been a very popular screen as of late, and those expectations for earlier in the year all but wiped out. There is very little expectation that this will happen, but June is really the pivotal point here. You take a look and see how many people are betting about that first rate cut happening in June. Investors, including in Mohamed Alarian, believing that it would be a mistake not to do so. Goldman Sachs coming out and saying that this is the likely scenario. But again, we have seen this path change very meaningfully in swaps markets. We'll keep an eye on that as well. But we'll talk about that Fed speak this week because with so many officials cautioning against rate cuts anytime soon here, you have Michelle Bowman really talking about the idea of certainly not now. You have Philip Jefferson saying, saying that there's a danger of easing too much. You have Patrick Harsher cautioning anyone from looking at it for right now and right away. And Lisa Cook looking to have greater confidence that inflation is converging to 2%. And joining us now to discuss this is Bank of America's Mer Megan Swiber here, because you were very early here to expect that June would really be the first set of cuts. The market was expecting so much more, so much sooner. When you look at the path of inflation, the, the data we've already seen seen in the PCE next week, how much risk is there that June won't even happen at this point? Uh, you know, Shanali, I think the market has come a long way in meeting expectations for what the Fed has laid out in the in the December summary of economic projections. When I was last on uh, after the, the January Fed meeting, what we were talking about was the fact that the market really had come a long way in wanting those cuts earlier, faster, sharper. And that was the market sitting with inflation pricing, this very sharp pace of, um, of, of inflation being able to fall and moderate. And really on the back of a lot of the strong data that we've seen, both of those two things have been able to correct. We still certainly think that June is possible. June is our, our base case call at B of A. Um, but the risks here, as we've heard the Fed speaker say, they're just in no rush. They're in no hurry to cut rates. And it makes sense given just how easy financial conditions are sitting right now. Well, some of the cases would be for cuts of the economy slowing down a little more, inflation coming down to a more comfortable level. You see those evidences of tightening. But we're sitting here in extraordinary market exuberance, record issuance. Exactly. How much is this kind of easy market feeling going to throw a wrench in that June cut? You know, it's a great question. And we actually heard the Fed talking more explicitly about this in the minutes which were released this past week. Uh, really what the Fed is squarely focused on, as they have to be, is inflation. We've got the easy part of the inflation story done. Goods has, has converged right back to where it, where it should be. And, and it should ultimately be really not adding to inflationary pressure, should be settling closer to zero. 
So a lot more of the inflation story that the Fed is focused on is services. Some of these components that tend to be more cyclical, tend to be more so related to financial conditions. And what the Fed is focused on here is just the notable easing in financial conditions that we've seen. And if that persists, it does raise questions about how confident, which is the key word here, the Fed can be to, uh, to cut rates. There are some voices inside the market who believe that a rate cut is even possible. It's not always the base case for most people out there, but there is a possibility. What would make that possibility a reality? So the possibility of an incremental hike, I think, would be uh, ultimately that the Fed would see a reacceleration of some of these inflationary pressures, right? So the idea that um, the Fed is not making as much progress as expected, certainly not our base case. The market's base case is certainly not that as well. But I think what it would have to come down to is expectations that really progress on inflation has completely stalled. The financial conditions have gotten too easy, and the Fed has to do something to push back on that. Again, not really the base case here, um, and certainly would drive really a, a very notable pivot for the Treasury market that, that I focus so much on. Um, but not not base case. But I would say a risk, particularly if this data that we're going to see in February uh, that, that we'll see print for February confirms some of the strength that we got in January. Quickly here, there's a lot of issuance that is coming to yes. the market just next week. Yep. At what point does that start to get more difficult for markets to absorb? Good. I mean, great question. So far, a lot of this supply that we seen has been so easy to be absorbed, right? There's just been so much demand for fixed income at these elevated rate levels. We're still seeing, we're seeing today better buying in the Treasury market, even on the back of Fed comments that have been considered relatively hawkish. Um, so there is a lot of appetite. The big question for fixed income is really what you brought up is the question is, is if, is, as long as the Fed is leaning towards cuts, as long as there's conviction that rates are going to be falling, that dip buying mentality is going to be there. It's going to be prominent. But if that macro conviction wavers, if we see the market really wonder what's the point for the Fed to have to push back on some of these things, that to me would be one of the big concerns for the demand picture. Certainly a lot in the air. Megan Swiber, we thank you for your time. Now up next, the auction block. AbV adds to the rush of high-grade issuance as companies look to fund acquisitions. Details next. This is Real Yield on Bloomberg. I'm Shanali Basik, and this is Bloomberg Real Yield. And it's time now for the auction block. Once again, high-grade U.S. issuance topping estimates. This week's supply surpassing the $50 billion level that dealers had forecasted. The stars of the week include AbbVie, Cisco, AstraZeneca, and HCA. And it's the most active week by volume this year after more than $60 billion were priced. And I want to dig into that AbbVie jumbo deal a bit more because the company looks to fund deals. The sale was in seven parts, and the long this portion, a 40-year bond yielding 105 basis points over treasuries. Investors placed orders for more than 80 billion of the bonds. And I want to mention this week's $9 billion auction of 30-year tips didn't go as well. The sale was awarded at a yield of 2.2%, tailing the when-issued yield. It also marks the highest auction since 2010. BlackRock's Amanda Lynham weighing in on where spreads go from here. We are often asked kind of, is the risk uh, to spreads tighter or wider? I actually think it can be tighter. I, I, I wouldn't necessarily say that I would be surprised if we saw a little bit of widening from here. I, be, I would believe that that would be a healthy correction, but I don't think it's out of the realm of possibilities that spreads could actually move tighter from here because that yield-based demand has brought out. Now we're going to bring in an all-star cast, Megan Graper, Global Co-Head of Debt Capital Markets at Barclays, Matt Brill, Head of North America Investment Grade Credit at Invesco, and Jose Pluto, Managing Director and Portfolio Manager at Newberger Berman. Buy side, sell side, we've got it all. Megan, we start with you because you're the one with the very busy week here. Investment grade issuance just slamming. But how much is left in the pipeline now? I mean, there's a decent amount still to go. I think March will be an, another incredibly active month. I mean, we hit the ground running in 2024. It's yet to show any signs of losing steam. And we printed $53 billion already over a three-day week. But if you want any indicator of just the outright strength of the technical backdrop and investment grade, um, this reemergence of Friday is actually a viable execution window, is it. And we're, we're seeing that evidenced here again today. There's a jumbo financing for Solventum, which is a deal Barclays is involved with. 
Um, and I, I think there's increased expectations that that theme will continue uh, into Q2. Um, you know, you'd have to, in 2023, I think there were maybe five days in all of 2023 that were supportive of Friday issuance. So it just gives you a sense of the backdrop we're operating in. It feels like demand is just insatiable here. And if you're on the buy side, and if you see $80 billion, $85 billion coming in for a $15 billion offer, Matt, what does it feel like to you to be sitting on the other side of that? And do you like where spreads are even at right now? <laughs> well, I don't can't say I love where spreads are at, but it's all about yield. And, and so we've been very, very busy this week, just taking in deal after deal. And it's just been incredible how easily it's been absorbed. And at the end of the week, you know, here we are on a Friday and Megan mentioned there's a Solventum deal out there. And I, I can't say whether they're going to buy it or not. But if we were, I feel like I was going to have to beg Wolfie on the over at JP Morgan for bonds. But I just could ask Megan if we were to buy that, you know, maybe she could give me some more because we still have cash. And that's the crazy thing that's going on right now. There's been so much supply and yet you're not done with being able to buy enough. And it's just unbelievable. It, it begs the question, Jose, too, if you if you don't like where spreads are at, but you like yields, then will you go further out on the risk spectrum to really be making your money here? Yes, yeah, Shanali, when you think about trying to generate attractive total return and consistent income, which are our objectives, really, it's really led us to uh, focus very heavily on the securitized products markets. Securitized products today offer attractive yields and spreads on a relative basis compared to things like investment grade corporate credit and some of those historical relationships. We also think that securitized products offer uh, a unique opportunity to diversify away some of those uh, concentrations as well. So when you think about where Securitize generates its returns from, it's from it's from housing, the consumer, and commercial real estate sectors that really offer some differentiated exposures relative to the broader corporate credit markets. Uh, final thought there as well, on a, from a technical backdrop perspective, you know, Securitize product issuance compared to some of the other parts of the market has been relatively modest, um, in particular coming off of some of the challenges, say, in commercial real estate and slower origination and lending volumes there, uh, as well as on the housing side with lower housing turnover, we're seeing relatively modest amounts of new supply. Uh, when you combine that with the relative value on, uh, on offer in the market, it, we think it sets up for a very favorable backdrop for securitized product performance. I'm curious about not only credit risk here, but sector risk, as you kind of alluded to here, Jose. Megan, when you look at investor appetite for deals and, you know, even beyond the, the orders they're putting on the table, the tone that they have around sectors like housing or consumer, anything that's outside of this seemingly invincible uh, technology world that we've been living in or healthcare that people are excited about, do they get finicky? They don't. It's been it's been pretty broad based buying, and I think that's because corporate fundamentals are are in incredibly great shape. I mean, if we think about what's driven a third of the volumes we've seen in February, it's largely been M and A, and and you know I think borrowers we're talking to just from a fundamental perspective are very defensively positioned, even those in some of the more storied uh, sectors. And in many cases, they've operated as though a recession actually has already happened. I mean, you're looking at the amount of cash that's on some of these corporate balance sheets. It's increased meaningfully. Um, and at the same time, we've seen share buybacks pared down. You've seen CapEx growth slow. So I just think fundamentally, um, there's a comfortability with investment grade in particular. It's picking and choosing your spots and maybe picking and choosing where in the curve you're deploying cash into some of those names. But this overarching sort of reach for yield, the, the strength of demand just continues to astound, I think, most of us in the market. Matt, what would cause you to kind of get out your get out get out on the curve here on credit risk a little bit? So you know what's interesting is is a lot of the extension uh, from a retail standpoint, it's in it's in T bills, it's in CDs, it's in money market funds, and we've been really trying to almost beg people to step out the curve and say try to lock this in for longer. It's totally different on the institutional side where you're seeing annuity sales, pension plans, insurance companies, they are just gobbling up as much as they possibly can of the long end. So it's really hard to say uh, when the retail investor steps out. Um, for us, you know, I, I don't love the flat curves that are out the curve, uh, that are out the curve. You're looking at tens, thirties are pretty, are pretty flat. And then thirties, 30 years versus 40 years. And some of these deals have been able to, as low as five basis points. So that's extremely low, but I have to respect the technicals. And I think if you're an institutional investor and you can lock in for 30 years, you know, quality companies like Cisco at five plus percent 
you know, they're, they're going to do that. And so whether I need that paper or not, I have to understand that somebody else does. And that's the balance right now of trying to figure out, you know, maybe there's not great value, but to somebody else that doesn't care about value, they just are forced to buy it. Um, how can I get in front of that? While we're thinking about risk here, too, Jose, you were talking about some of the more beaten par down parts of the market, consumer, commercial, real estate. Do you feel that prices have bottomed enough for you to start picking at any pieces? Yeah, absolutely, uh, Shanali. So the number one question we get these days is, is primarily around commercial real estate, the outlook for it, and, and what the implications are for the CMBS markets. We think it really has afforded uh, an interesting environment to be able to use credit selection to find uh, good opportunities with low leverage, properties that have resilient value characteristics, strong operating income that should allow a refinancing even in, a, in, a, in an elevated interest rate environment like today. Uh, additionally, when you think about just the overall interest rate environment and the lock-in effect that homeowners have had by virtue of having very low rates on their existing mortgages relative to prevailing mortgage rates and the record amounts of home equity that uh, homeowners have built into their homes through house price appreciation, it's creating opportunities uh, in both agency uh, mortgage-backed securities as well as things like second lien mortgages uh, to be able to capitalize on some of the unique aspects of where we find ourselves today. Uh, and finally, new sectors emerging, things like telecommunications infrastructure securitizations, uh, data centers, wireless towers, fiber optic networks. These are all things that really didn't exist in the securitization markets five or six years ago and are creating new opportunities for investment-grade fixed income that offer incremental yield and spread relative to, to other alternatives you know, that we think are, are an example of some, some unique areas that you can pick up. Uh, interesting yields without taking a lot of incremental risk. Searching for spread, it's interesting. I think a lot of people are, are looking at that, even with yields or where they are. Megan, what would cause spreads to start to widen a little more from here? I don't see it happening near term. I, I think by and large, you're seeing um, just the depth and breadth to the uh, underlying investor base underpinning spreads. And I think our call here at Barclays is that we could see an incremental five basis points of improvement, even off of spreads on the industrial side that are close to 25 year lows. So I just think there are limited headwinds from a macro or fundamental side. And I think, you know, the short answer is that investors continue to reach that are continuing to reach for risk are nothing if, if not yield driven. And I think historically, when coupons are high, spread volatility is low. And I think that's what we should expect over over the coming months, certainly into the first half of the year. You know, it's interesting. We've been talking so much about the euphoria. I want to address a counterpoint here because Bank of America analysts had been writing, strategists worried that they're worried about a credit bubble. And they wrote, what are the classic signs of a credit bubble when discipline goes out of the window and markets buy deteriorating credits because of feeling of quote unquote value? Matt, do you think that we are in a credit bubble? I, I do not. And I think the key thing they said there was that buying deteriorating credits. And it's very hard to find deteriorating credits right now. Even if you look at the banks that can be challenged, the regional banks, you know, they're, are they deteriorating? I, I actually don't think so. I think they're improving from a from a very big scare uh, in 2023. So the loan loss provisions that are happening there are setting up you know, fairly nicely to protect you if and when the commercial real estate um, losses begin or, or, or really um, you know, exacerbate. But overall, you know, I, I'm just not seeing a downgrade wave lower. I'm not seeing really cracks. And, you know, I, I go back to really the last 18 months, you've been hearing about this big recession that's going to happen. And most corporations have been preparing for a recession that just has never come. So in that regard, they're very well set up for this. And so I, I just, you know, yes, spreads are tight, but I'm not seeing the massive, you know, beta fundamental risk that I think that, that you know, they're, they're alluding to in that, in that statement. Jose, I'm kind of curious about the securitization play here. Is some of this uh, a reflection of just how things are trading, the, the return you get, or do you need securitization from where you sit to protect against some of those potential losses? Yeah, Shanali, when I think about uh, you know, potential losses, you know, securitization really structure is what des is designed to protect you um, in addition to underlying collateral quality. You know, when I look at markets like commercial real estate and the dislocation we've had there, no doubt there have been challenges. But when we look at 
both the structure of underlying securities, the amount of credit enhancement you get, say, to the investment grade portion of the capital structure in a CMBS transaction, as well as the low overall leverage on loans being produced today, generally around 50 percent, that even if you have a great amount of uncertainty around the underlying path for where values settle or where interest rates end up, you have a lot of protection built into structures that's designed to, to withstand challenging environments. The same can be said for much of the consumer um, ABS markets as well. Um, when you think about uh, where the performance has been on things like auto loans, certainly no secret that delinquency rates have gone up. That's been, uh, I think, a very well advertised story. But when you look under the hood at the underlying transactions themselves, you have a significant amount of credit enhancement that's built into the deals that's designed to absorb losses. Additionally, what the numbers today don't take into account is that many originators have retrenched their credit standards for origination. And so going forward, you are seeing initial positive signs that performance is improving. Credit investors just as bullish as we see equity investors are. Guys, have a great weekend and a great week ahead. Megan, you probably need that sleep after a week like this one. <laughs> Megan Graper, Matt Brill, and Jose Pluto, we thank you all for your time. Now, still ahead, the final spread. The week ahead, a big week. The Fed's preferred inflation gauge is in focus. This is Real Yield on Bloomberg. I'm Shanali Basak, and this is Bloomberg Real Yield. And it's time now for the final spread, the week ahead. Coming up, we're going to get new home sales data on Monday and Tuesday, durable goods and consumer confidence. Let's see how they feel. Wednesday, a slate of Federal Reserve speakers coming from Raphael Bostic, Susan Collins, and John Williams. And Thursday, all eyes on the preferred gauge of inflation, that is U.S. PCE data, and more Fed speak on Friday. Now, I want to bring you more on that PCE data for my final thought before I let you go here, because we had some optimistic printing here in the most recent print, and optimism stays in the estimates here. We have a cooling down of the deflator to 2.4 percent from 2.6 percent, and the core deflator to 2.8 from 2.9. Let's see if we get there, though. And we know that the markets are sensitive. Strong economic data brought yields higher this week. Let's see what another week brings. From New York, that does it from us. Same time, same place next week. This was Bloomberg Real Yield, and this is Bloomberg. Thank you.